Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. very compelling evidence that we uh, we may not be alone, whatever that means. Characteristics appear to demonstrate advanced technology. Arrow is the culmination of decades of DOD intelligence community and congressionally directed efforts to successfully resolve UAP encountered first and foremost by U.S. military. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Disclosure Team. I'm your host, Vinnie Adams. The following is an interview with Lester Nair. Lester is the founder of UAP Caucus, focusing primarily on the government aspect of the phenomena and disclosure. In this interview, we cover many areas, including Kona Blue, Jason Sands, the recent signal messages released on the Black Vault between Christopher Mellon and Sean Kirkpatrick, the AIAA mandate, the UAP origin classification system, and much more. If you enjoy these interviews, please take a second to subscribe to the channel if you don't already. Hit the like button. And if you want to comment down below, please do. I try and check all messages. I hope you enjoy this interview with Lester Nair. So Lester, thank you so much for joining me, my friend. How are you today? Doing well, Vinny. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit from the uh, Arsenal loss, I mean, the Chelsea loss to Arsenal yesterday, but a 5-0 drubbing with two goals from Kai Havertz is a little tough to swallow. But that's a different podcast. Hey, man, I, do you know what? I would love to be on that podcast. You, <laughs> you're, you're, you are correct. Yes, we're here for, for the uh, UAP subject. So I guess I really like before we get into kind of everything that's been, been going on recently, if you could kind of go back and tell me when you first sort of got into the whole UAP UFO subject. Yeah, so for me, there's sort of maybe two inciting incidents. I had a, a quite a mundane sighting in 2012 in my early 20s, um, orb situation, amber color flying in very peculiar formation. But at the time, I didn't really do much with it. I kind of was like, oh, that's a little weird. But really, I think the the thing that got me most interested was the WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks releases in, I guess, either 2015, 2016, uh, in which there were some email exchanges around this concept of disclosure. Obviously, by that time, like many people, I've been aware of the ideas and the, the Lazar stories and the various kind of history points that had existed. That's really when I kind of decided to, coming from a political junkie angle of things, I was like, oh, okay, there's a government connection here that's grounded and has a chain of custody. So let's kind of dig in a little bit more. And then obviously with 2017 and the subsequent legislation that was released, that was really, I think, from, from my angle, what what solidified it as the having a need for consistent coverage uh because again if we're having congress in the u.s legislate around what they believe to be critical credible allegations around this issue 
and no one is talking about it uh, in a substantive way in terms of the public media side, that, that felt like there needed to be a little bit of, of work done in that area among many. Completely agree. Absolutely. Now, we're going to probably jump around from a few different topics, but obviously the big talking point at the moment is is whistleblowers. And even a few days ago, we had this new uh, gentleman step forward on a, a Twitter space or an X space, let's say, Jason Sands, making these bold claims. What's your take on it after, you know, we've had a few days to kind of look at what is available? Yeah, you know, I, I know it's definitely caused a lot of consternation, uh, particularly amongst the UFO Twitter community. Um, we've obviously been hearing for several years now, you know, in part from David Grush's testimony, as well as through the grapevine, that there's this large set of, you know, UFO program whistleblowers up to 40 that are waiting in the wings to come forward, looking for the right forum, the right opportunity, the right timing. Um, ostensibly, although there's some debate about this, Jason Sands is one of this cohort, maybe not part of the specific list of 40 that David Grush was speaking about, but a part of this general orbit of folks who are, are looking to come forward. You know, he, he did a long Twitter space. It was, I don't know, six hours plus. Um, I, I did get a chance to listen to it um, and try to look at some of the analysis and things that people have gone back and forth on. I, I generally am not on the whistleblower side of the conversation. I, I generally stick more to the sort of government policy aspect, partly because for my expertise and where I'm positioned, there's not really much I can do or say about what Jason Sands has brought forward beyond what we've been doing with other folks who have come forward with varying versions of, of the same thing. I think it was helpful that he provided some of his credentials. So he, he worked in the Air Force. You know, um, I think there's been some obvious pushback from the likes of Dr. Eric Davis, you know, saying he doesn't know what he's talking about. But when you listen to some of the stuff he says, I think that there's a couple of challenges here. I've tweeted about this repeatedly about that the medium is the message and people might disagree with that, but I really do think where we are in the, the story cycle, where you choose to come out first and how that information is packaged really matters. Um, you know, of, of over a six hour space, there's a lot of information that's said and whether you like it or not, people are going to clip and pull out things that are beneficial to whatever narrative that they want to suggest and given it was an open forum for different conversations i think he shared a lot about what his experience was but then also opined on a variety of other topics in the uap subject that may have not been from his direct experience that now muddy what the difference is between what he knows versus what he's heard or thinks or what he's sort of ascertained and that distinction it it, it matters you know it's it's important so I think it's sort of a let's see what happens as we go forward and more people start to try to, you know, look at what he's saying and and verify, et cetera. So I don't really have much to say other than obviously, like I'm I encourage whistleblowers to to come forward. We have to continue to create an environment where they feel safe to do so. But at the same time, I do think the strategic decision making that is done when you come forward is really important. And if you don't want to get mired in a lot of nonsense, I think the decision would have been different in terms of how to come forward. But again, you know, it's easy for me to say an armchair quarterback. So I think at the end of the day, more is is generally good, but we need to move to a place where we can get to, you know, can you be coming forward either in a, verif a form that can do the verification or with some form of verification, whether that's documentation or uh, sort of corroborative testimony from others, I think is the stage that we're at now. I think many people know I tweeted yesterday's price is not today's price um, after the UAPDA came out. And what I mean by that is exa exactly like this, you know, David Grush has set the standard and the, and the foundation of what the level is that you need to kind of go out uh, to be taken seriously. Anything that happens below that line unfortunately, is not living up to the bar that's already been set. So that's not to disparage Jason or anything. I, I, I don't have an opinion either way, but I think it's the medium is the message and it really does matter um, 
where we are now in a post crush era. Completely. Yes. It's very difficult. You know, I've, I've held back from making any public statements or putting any opinions out there purely for the same reason. I don't have all the information. Some of what he says maybe throws up maybe some kind of red flags to me, but because we're missing information and there are processes in place for whistleblowers to come forward. Um, there are rumors flying around that he has been vetted by Arrow and the DOD and, you know, they didn't find him credible. But again, we can't sort of lay our head on rumors and just, you know, stick with that. We need to sort of let it play out. But do you think the current whistleblower legislation that we have now is enough? Because there's always talk of extra, you know, things being added to it in the future to give them more safety. Do you think that's enough at the moment or what do we? I, I, I do. I do think that there's room for improved coverage. And I think you don't need to look any farther than the email exchange that was released by John Greenwald between uh, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, uh, as well, alongside David Grush and some of Mellon's messages. If you look at the content matter of what Grush was pushing back on in terms of wanting to come in, he was getting really into the weeds of the difference between the special access program coordination office versus the management office versus the control access program coordination office and whether or not they had non-title 10 uh, waivers for the DOE and the NSC. The point of me just throwing out all that is there's a huge level of complexity around the different compartments and security classification guidelines that you know impact the intersection of the intelligence community, the Department of Defense, and other executive agencies like the Department of Energy and the National Security Council. And the allegation is that these programs sort of lie at an intersection of all of these things. Um, and as such, just because you have coverage uh, from a DOD, uh, you know, special access program coordination office doesn't necessarily mean that if there's some aspects of it that cross other avenues that you're covered. So I think the current whistleblower protections sort of have these piecemeal ways of covering, but don't necessarily have the blanket coverage that would have been provided in the language that was in the proposed original UAP Disclosure Act, which would have overwritten sort of the, this bifurcated, this, this sort of amalgam of different security guidelines you have to operate by now. I'm not saying that I think, I think there's some questions about whether Grush is sort of making a distinction without a difference or not with some of these, you know, classification programs. I can't speak to that, but I think the point is there is not a blanket whistleblower protection coverage that would address what David Grush is bringing up about this sort of these isolated coverages that you need in order to feel comfortable. Again, even if you talk about the UAP related stuff, if there are other conventional aspects in that program, that might not be covered based on what's currently uh, set out in place. So it's complicated. And I do think that we can have improvement on a more blanket and robust whistleblower protection that is specifically for the UAP issue, but gives coverage to conventional programs such that by coming forward, speaking about UAP stuff, you're not risking, you know, legal jeopardy because as a part of that, you reveal conventional programs. Yeah, it does seem that these legacy programs do sit in a gray area that's disjointed between the different agencies and departments that that's why we can't quite nail it down. Uh, and just sticking with Christopher Mellon, we had another release, I think through the Black Vault as well, which mentions this Kingman, Arizona case from 1953. And, you know, that's been a, a point of contention for many years. Was it real? Was it not? And it's, you know, thrown back into the conversation. And it, it does make things very difficult for researchers, I feel, uh, with missing pieces of this puzzle. Um, There's an interesting thing about the, the, the release from, from, from Mel. And so, so I think the, and this is, you know, there's been so much happening even in the last just two weeks alone. So it was, you know, we had the, 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 the historical report from Arrow came out and then Arrow then released the Kona Blue Files. And then about two days later is when John Greenwald published the original threads between Grush and Kirkpatrick. And involved, included in that were some signal messages from Christopher Mellon and, and Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. 
And in response to that, I did find it interesting that Chris's name was the only one not redacted in that release. My assumption is because he's already a public figure that has gone out and talked about his involvement with this issue. I think it's understandable that they didn't feel the need to um, redact it. So that, that makes sense. But a, about a day or two after uh, the Black Vault released those original uh, messages, Chris chose to post a Substack post along with the image of a separate conversation thread he had uh, with a senior government official around this, this Kingman crash. And there's something really, I think there's a couple of interesting things about this. One, um, he had gotten that cleared by uh, the Defense Office of P Publication and Security Review, DOPSER, on March 1st. Um, so this was well in advance of John Greenwald's post. So it wasn't a reactionary thing where he's like, you know, it was reactionary in the sense that he probably wouldn't necessarily posted it now without that, but he'd already had the clearance for it. So I think that brings up this point that a lot of these folks are probably sitting on a ton of these breadcrumbs, these pieces of information. They've gone through the security review process. Jason Sands said he just also finished that security review process. So I found it interesting that like, you know, that was something he felt like he could put out now. Someone who's generally conservative about the crash retrieval angle to be so direct and in your face with putting the necessary caveats that the person who shared it with him was not a firsthand whistleblower, which I think is important. But I actually have it pulled up here. I think the one of the most important things for me from that message, obviously the association with the crash retrieval, but but the idea that the the quote was, we now know the management structure and security control systems and ownership of the crash retrieval. Um, we also know who recovers landed or crash UFOs under what authorities. Um, and they also have identified an Air Force gatekeeper. The reason why someone like me, who's more on the policy side and trying to interface with Congress cares about this is at the end of the day, it becomes where is it, who's in control of it, and what are the sort of the, the systems of which access is determined. And we've not really gotten any kind of clarity that that level of information with any kind of specificity, we, don't, we haven't really gotten any of that. This was one of the first times where it's like, yes, we know the control structure. So the point here is it's, it's falsifiable, right? Regardless of whether you believe the person that messaged Mellon is actually saying something that is existent truthful, we know where to go to answer the question. Um, and I think that's always where I come back to is like, where do we get the pieces of information that allow us to go and then do the validation or do the verification? And when I say we, by way of these congressional committees that have apparently had this information for two plus years at this point. Yeah. And, and you mentioned there that like that, that document there that you talked about with the Kingman thing. And you said it's likely that people have got lots of different things like this, these breadcrumbs, but are choosing not to release it. If you were to speculate, do you think that they may be holding it back as to not disrupt policy that is in place so that it doesn't take away from the, the direction that we want to go in, like through the, the right structures? So I, I, that seems to me to be the theory of the case that these folks are approaching it with. And um, in part because of the fact that there is already the investigation happening within both intelligence committees within the House and within the Senate, who would have the purview over programs like this. I think one of the interesting notes from the thread between Kirkpatrick and uh, one of the um, DOD special access program control officials was that the armed services committees in the House and the Senate were not actually able to hear and listen to the information from David Grush because the intelligence committees hold a really tight stranglehold on the whistleblower process for anything that has any connection to the intel community. So that's kind of an interesting sort of inside baseball note. But the other thing about this is in those recent releases and messages that came out, the intimation that there is a Department of Defense, uh, sorry, Department of Justice investigation that is active as it relates to David Grush's allegations among the other whistleblowers. And in that context, right, there's been rumors that maybe there is, you know, 
when when you bring a PPD-19, a, a whistleblower protection complaint forward to the Intelligence Community Inspector General, if they deem it credible and urgent, that triggers them to report it to the um, uh, ODNI, who runs all of the intelligence committees, the uh, agencies, et cetera, as well as reporting it to the intel committees in Congress. And if it is deemed that there's potential criminal behavior, the ICIG has the option to also then refer it to the DOJ. It seems at this point that we can feel relatively confident that there has been a criminal referral being sent to the DOJ. And in that context, if there has been that criminal referral sent and there is knowledge of that amongst these folks, they don't want to step on the toes of that investigation for any number of reasons because that could create a situation where if they come out and say something, then the person who is potentially liable for committing said crimes would be able to then use that at, at trial and then get out of it. So I'm not saying that that's true, but it is feasibly the thought process, whether you're looking at it from the Intel Committee's investigation or the potential DOJ investigation. If I had some of the stuff, I wouldn't necessarily put it public because ultimately those are going to be the best forms for the adjudication. And then once that those processes are getting towards a conclusion, at that point, you know, it makes sense for it to go public. So I think that's why they're likely being hesitant to get ahead of the story in that context. And do you think in the same vein that this could be the same reason why we've not seen other whistleblowers step forward in the, the same way that Grush did following that, uh, that process? Again, and I think you're asking the right questions. If it is true that the Department of Justice is doing a criminal investigation into Grush's allegations, and as a, as a reminder, you know, there are like five levels to his allegations. It's not just the crafts and bodies. It's the disinformation campaign, withholding of classified information, misappropriation of funds, and then the um, retaliation against whistleblowers, all of which potentially have some sort of criminal exposure. So in theory, it could be any number of those things um, that aren't necessarily explicitly crafts and bodies. But if that's already ongoing, it also may be the case that if these whistleblowers are coming forward to either of the inspector generals in the DOD or the ICIG, and they have knowledge of said ongoing criminal investigations, they might make the suggestion to not speak publicly because of those ongoing investigations. And given in the U.S., we've we've all gotten a lesson in the criminal justice system because of our past presidency and the level of ire that that brought up in the DOJ. We now all know about this idea that people would go on the news and say, oh, I can't talk about it because... So it, it's that would be a feasible reason why um, more are not coming forward. Obviously, this is we're trying to sort of fill in the blanks here, and there's a lot of conjecture. So I just you know want to be clear that this none of this is necessary. You can look at the FOIA documents, and that is the implication of what is in the documents. But we don't have no investigations except for James Comey that one time with Hillary are supposed to publicize that they're happening until they've concluded. So we're going to kind of be a little bit in the dark here. I would imagine, though, given the scale and scope of what's being alleged, if those were deemed credible and urgent, there would be criminal referrals. And um, I, I do, I would understand why that would limit, to some extent, um, whistleblowers either from feeling comfortable coming forward or being really allowed to do so without putting those in jeopardy. Sure, sure. Um, I just want to give a message to everybody who is watching this on YouTube. You will have already seen, as we've been talking, some of the documents we've mentioned. They would, I would have flashed them up on screen, but you can also go to the description of this video and go and look at it, look at them for yourself. Uh, you know, take your time and read through them to get any context that that you may need that we haven't kind of covered. I would really encourage people to actually read the stuff, like really sit down and read it. I think one of the things that's been interesting in my view lately is is the follow-ups are almost more important than the initial like headline that drops so you know as the example right the 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 big headline that drops is the arrow Aero historical report and then the follow-up is the release of the kona blue project and when you look at that it's there's a lot of fascinating fascinating information just in that deck alone that has any number of follow-up questions and curiosities that arise i mean the same thing with you know, the release of the mess signal messages and then Mellon drops a follow up. So I think I think it's it's really important for us to actually read and and not move on too quickly to the next shiny object.
because there's a lot of great areas of follow-up and investigation for us to do from the sort of citizen journalism side of things. There are names, there are like offices, agencies. We can start really filling in those gray areas that you were talking about of the mosaic by, again, just going down some of those different avenues uh, and just asking questions or also doing follow-up FOIA requests. I think one of the challenges is we have only a few real FOIA warriors in the community, and each person has their own perspective of what's worth the time, energy, and money to FOIA, right? And there are so many other things that if we just had more nodes doing so would help fill out that picture um, in other avenues or other angles of inquiry, um, which I think there are plenty that go beyond some of the popular characters that we continually try to adjudicate absolutely you're right in saying i seem to see uh, that these things are linked you can move on to the next thing but be be sure to keep the previous thing in mind as well because there does seem to be some cross sort of correlation between these things and you mentioned there kona blue and we've been hearing that name before the release of the documents and it just seems that the timing uh, you know you could read into that a little bit um but could you just just for anybody that may be watching that doesn't understand what Kona Blue actually is, could you just give us a brief overview of, of what it was intending to do? Thank you. And I, Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, and I think that UFO podcast did a great, you know, deep, deeper dive breakdown. So I, I don't want to claim to be the absolute expert, but I think of both that UAP uh, podcast or that UFO podcast and Joe Merja on Twitter has done a great threads on this as well. I think we've, we've heard about this for quite some time now. So if anyone has listen to the likes of Dr. Colm Kelleher, Dr. Jim Lekatsky, uh, and the work that they've done with George Knapp across the, the books that they've done in the history of the OSAP program. Ultimately, you know, Kona Blue was sort of meant to be that next evolution, the, 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 what OSAP was really meant to be at scale. The idea was this was a proposed special access program uh, that was going to be housed within the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, which is interesting because we've sort of seen DHS released a couple videos here and there, and they've sort of been an agency that has been referenced occasionally, but hasn't been as prominent as the DOD, the CIA, the DOE. Um, so that was interesting that there's clearly a lot of, you know, understanding around this issue in DHS. They did seem to be the right organization to handle this proposed special access program. It set out a budget of, I believe, about $87 million for the first three years, starting in 2012, 2013. Um, and the idea with this program was what was described by David Grush in his News Nation interview late last year about uh, you know what Harry Reid, uh, former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, was trying to do, which was this alleged craft that a Lockheed Martin had that they wanted to divest. And this program was sort of a catch bucket to be able to take the materials from private aerospace, put it into something that had government access, and then they would split it up into different teams. One would look at it from a materials perspective um, and do that kind of reverse engineering process. Then there was sort of this consciousness study, study side of it um, that would also try. So what's so interesting is the way that the document is written now is exactly like what we've heard Dr. Kelleher, Dr. Likatsky, uh, uh, Harry Reid and Gress sort of intimate, uh, but they've never been able to say the program name and all that stuff because it was still, it was unclassified, but not for public distribution, I think was the proper, uh, so it didn't need to be declassified, it just needed to be uh, prepared for public distribution. Um, so th that's the gist of, of the Kona Blue program, but if you really look in the weeds of the document, the, the process of how it was proposed who was involved in approving it, Tara O'Toole, who was a super high level official, not associated really with being sort of a part of the inner circle of the UAP topic, thought it was viable. And, and, and just the language that's used in that document that's very direct uh, around this idea of these advanced aerial vehicles. And, you know, it, it, it is one of the first sort of things where we see a lot of inside baseball about how these secret programs are structured. I think one of the most fascinating slides was the organizational chart for how they wanted to actually structure the program. Again, if you if you've read, you know, 
Skinwalkers at the Pentagon or any of the other two books. Other, it's it's what they've been talking about. Um, and to see that in official government documentation uh, at the scale that they were looking to invest, $87 million is a lot of money. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's really, I think there's so many threads to pull just from that, even in helping us understand how to think about now doing, again, FOIA requests for other kind of programs that have those uh, aspects or structures. So in any event, I, I think it's, um, it, it sort of is more corroborative evidence that's come forward to some of the allegations that we've heard historically from some of these folks. The Kona, the release of Kona Blue timing from Arrow was curious to me. I think the the way people are kind of analyzing it is they're trying to frame Kona Blue as the program that whistleblowers are coming forward alleging had possession of these materials and trying to explain it away of like, oh, they said it was this and they didn't have the stuff. Where again, and this is potentially why some of these insiders have been trying to put these stories out by way of these books and stuff to have a record uh, historically to to point to the fact that how can they have had the materials if this was a pr proposed special access program that ultimately never was stood up in the first place? And that's never been the allegation from the folks on the inside that the program itself had the materials, but they were creating it in order to acquire them. So it, it, that seems to be pretty clear in the record that already exists. So the idea that Arrow would try to like rewrite that history to make Kona Blue seem to be this thing. This is the program everyone was talking about, and there's nothing there. It seems like a mistake to me, just from a, from there from the strategic approach from them. But that's that appears to be at least right now what they're trying to set up. Um, again, because Dr. Shankar Patrick mentioned the Kona Blue program in an interview uh, with some defense industry sort of. Uh, 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 podcast conference thing uh, in that same vein that, oh, this is what they said it was, and it wasn't that. So curious, but uh, again, there's a lot there for us to pull threads on, and I don't think we should move forward from it too quickly, especially given this seems to have some kind of aspect to whatever narrative is trying to be uh, spun right now. Yeah, I found it very disappointing when Sean Kirkpatrick did that, it's trying to say that Kona Blue, well, it didn't exist, so therefore it didn't have, uh, you know, the, the materials. And I think for anybody that really is paying attention, knew that it seemed they were trying to extract it out from within private industry to bring it back under the government umbrella, let's say. So, yeah. I mean, and, and let's stick with that. Dr. Kirkpatrick and Arrow, you know, they've all been pretty much but written off in, in recent months. How do you feel uh, we should look at Arrow going forward with new leadership? The Arrow conversation is challenging because there are sort of two sides to this, right? There is what can government do and the tools available at their disposal in order to move the issue forward? And then there's like what the larger community of interest understands is where we are and what we want to happen. And sometimes those two things don't always align. So for better or for worse, Arrow has been established as the as one of the government offices that is going to be involved in this issue. So even if you look at the proposed legislation for the Safe Airspace for Americans bill that's being pushed by Ryan Graves and ASA, within that bill language, Arrow is one of the organizations that is set out to help coordinate with the FAA around the storage of commercial pilot reporting, et cetera. So, it's one of those things where whether we like it or not, uh, when government creates something as a permanent entity and, and then new subjects come up moving forward that relate to the, that, the, the scope of that entity, it just becomes a catch-all bucket because people don't want to have to reinvent the wheel and go through that process again. So again, Arrow is not going to go anywhere and it will continue to be referenced as the coordination agency for this stuff moving forward. So in that context, how do we navigate that reality? Obviously, the change of leadership to director, I think it's Tim Phillips, away from Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, um, is, a, is potentially a hopeful change. Maybe the Kona Blue release is coming from the change of leadership that wants to take things in a different direction. Um, we, we have to wait and see kind of how that plays out. But um, I think ultimately, as we sort of know, if you look at the structure of the Department of Defense, 
And then within the Department of Defense, you have the uh, uh, the uh, USD office, which is the office that Lou used to work out of. That currently is now, I guess they got they got moved out of there, and it's now under the ODNI. But the there's not an incentive for that office, giving its authorities come from the same organization that is allegedly involved in hiding this information. It, it is it is hard to look to Arrow to do the job of the public transparency of responsibility that folks who are advocates of, quote, capital D disclosure are looking for. I think this is, again, why re reimagining the UAP Disclosure Act is important and why the fundamentals, as much as people wanted to complain about the details, the fundamentals were right. There are only two forums that I think will really unlock the stove piping issue that we're seeing and provide the avenue for whistleblowers. Um, one of those is uh, doing uh, long form public hearings in the Senate Intel Committee, similar to what we've seen historically with the Church Committee. That formula is, is clear. And every whistleblower that's come forward has all said the same thing. We want public hearings so that we can be under oath and speak to this issue. So that is one of the end forums. The other option is uh, legislation that establishes a explicit process like the ERB, the UAP Records Review Board, with presidential authority that then supersedes the gatekeepers within the DOD who are under the office of the president. So moving it from the this sort of ODNI, uh, DOD hierarchy being the ultimate end arbiter up to the office of the president, National Security Council, all those folks. And again, it's not a perfect solution, but those are the two viable channels. Anything outside of those two is not going to get to the quote, capital D disclosure place that we want to, unless this happens, again, disclosure and discovery paradigm is always how I think about this. So there's going to be the scientific investigation stuff that may or may not force the hand on the discovery side. But Arrow, I think, is going to continue to be coordinating the data and process and security stuff. And I think there was an interview that just came out today where Kirkpatrick, Dr. Kirkpatrick stated as much, our job isn't going to find aliens or public blah, blah, blah. It's the security and the data process, which that was Arrow's original mandate. And frankly, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick is not an investigator. That's not his skill set, right? So he was not well suited from his personal character traits to the kind of unstructured and expansive nature of, I think, where this needs to go. So Arrow will be there, but I think we should focus our energies from a public discourse perspective on public hearings and the revitalization of the UAPDA as those are ultimately the forums in which the validation process can be legitimate in a way where we can get consensus, in my, in my view, in my view. No, I, I completely agree with you there. Uh, those two directions would help us sort of get back on the track, on the, on the rails, let's say. But do you worry that this being an election year could put that on the back burner for some time? I know this is not a popular thing to say. And, you know, again, it's been going on forever. Why should another election, this and that? I, I totally get it. I really do. Um, but the reality is, and again, I think we suffer a little bit in the community of living in our own island too often and not contextualizing our conversations that we're having, which are important in the larger environment of everything else that's going on. And at the end of the day, Disclosure isn't that the couple tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, few million of us who know about this get the answer. That isn't really sort of capital. What it is, is that there's hundreds and millions, if not billions of people that have the same level of understanding about the issue. Um, and, you know, a, as such, we have to compete with every popular topic that is happening every single day. Um, the competition isn't against the DOD or that it's against every other subject matter. So in that, in that context, the election year is going to prevent significant momentum happening around this issue. Um, currently, from my viewpoint, the way the election in the U.S. is setting up, obviously we have President Trump versus former uh, President Biden versus former President Trump. And 
the, the, the narrative is being boiled down to a few key issues. Ukraine and Ukraine funding, Israel ceasefire and military funding, inflation, cost of living, right? And then I'll just put a fourth bucket of the culture wars, which is every issue from race, gender, all this stuff, right? That is what's going to dominate Congress. Um, and the reason why a TikTok bill passed is because that is a medium by which all of those issues are discussed, right? So um, that's the reality, right? Is so, so, so how do you then, knowing what people are focused on, how do we try to get the UAP issue to ride alongside these in order to, I think the way we should view the rest of the year is how do we, if, if things come in waves, right? How do we maintain the, the, the plateau here? So don't let it necessarily go down. We might not see it go up in terms of momentum, but if we can at least maintain the altitude, get through the election, and then as the new administration is settling in, a lot of things are gonna change. The leadership on committees is gonna change. So Mike Turner may or may not be the leader of the House Intel Committee uh, next uh, Congress. That could change the dynamics of what can happen. Who is within, you know, the staffing and around these, like there's things that can change as we move into the 119th Congress that may or may not benefit the effort towards pushing this. So this is a long winded answer, but I think this is really important. It's almost more important now that we have a very focused and aligned messaging on what we speak to Congress about being important and find ways to correlate it. One of the things that's been, we found the most successful actually in the last several weeks is we put together a, a white paper, basically evaluating the contradictions coming out of the DOD. We've had three major things come out of the DOD in the March time period. The DOD, or March, January to March, the IG evaluation, which basically said we don't have a system in place. The historical report, which said we looked everywhere and couldn't find anything, even though you don't have a system in place. And then the joint staff message uh, that was released by um, uh, Dean Johnson, which showed the Homeland Division creating a 96-hour reporting window for UAP sightings and explicitly defined UAP as vehicles that operate beyond the known performance envelopes and do not have a known like origin by... It, again, the same kind of definition we saw in the UAP Disclosure Act. Not... It, it's very specific. Um, and that went out throughout that Homeland Division. There, there's not a, a message that's clear coming out of the DOD, and that's all. Those are all DOD entities. That briefing packet, as we've sent it to Congress, and then they had the 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 uh, hearing with the Armed Services Committee, with the Air Force uh, and Space Force directors. The Langley flyover and that DOD contradiction stuff is resonating because of the tension now between Iran, uh, Israel, right? Uh, the tension between. Uh, Russia, Ukraine, and how that might, the conflicts abroad may start to spill over into issues at home if we're having active incursions over the homeland. That elicits an emotional response from staffers and members in Congress, which grounds the issue in a thing that it's in language they can understand. It's it's a it's a it's a, a, a an avenue that they can do something about, right? And so again, I, I'm I'm just identifying the practical reality of engaging in the political space in a time like this for an issue that's avant garde and out of the norm. And we just have to be cognizant of that. And it's not that people aren't interested or they don't care, but if there's nothing they can do about it right now. There's a million other things that they're going to then focus on instead of this. So that's kind of how we've been trying to frame it amongst the folks that we're working with on the, the sort of government engagement side and with the staffers we're talking to is framing it in that context, because now we've seen that that's been a driver to maintaining the relationships and conversations. I think we have maybe 15, 15 to 20 members where we have ongoing relationships with staffers now. And we've actually seen an increase in the engagement because of the tangible nature of the Langley flyover um, um, in recent weeks. So I, I think we need to keep our expectations in check, but there is a lot that is just 
happening in a variety of spaces outside of government, in government. So just because there's not chatter or people aren't doing a public statement all the time is not does not mean that there's not real work being done to try to figure out how does the ball actually move forward. It's complicated. Um, so long-winded answer, but I think this it's a really important point in terms of how we set our expectations. And, and kudos to Daniel Sheehan, who's doing huge work with um, MPI, I, I would I would say I'm not getting the same level of, we are not seeing the same level of um, focus on a UAPDA 2.0 at this time. That there, there, there is that work being done, but I don't think it's reached the fever pitch yet. It's still early. We'll likely start seeing more in the middle of the summer that really coming up, but um, I think we need to potentially, you know, be prepared for both a revamp that gets tried to get done or not a full revamp, but maybe some smaller individual bills uh, because everyone's uh, time and energy in November is going to be in the election and there might not be the same level of time to get into the weeds again. So I think the jury is still out at this point in time. Yeah, and I just want to urge everybody watching to go and not only look at UAP Caucus website, but check out the uh, the congressional briefing packet there that Lester just mentioned. It's very, very well put together. Uh, and let's stick with the work that, that you've been doing. What can you tell me about the UAP origin classification system that you've put together? Yeah, no, so this is, I, I mean, I think, you know, Vinny, I know you've been doing this for a while and, you know, you've worked with a ton of great people who have been doing this for even longer and you know, one of the things that I, we, 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 there's so much. And one of the things I always try to use to center myself is like, what are the people closest to the issue saying needs to be done or created or what work needs to be established? And, you know, we, we, we I always talk about this. The paradigm is disclosure, government releases and discovery scientific investigation. It's not one or the other. It's yes. And it's both. And so a lot of the work we do is trying to straddle those two arenas. We've already talked about the stuff we're doing with the white papers for Congress. Um, the release of the UAP origin classification system was trying to take, um, we saw Danny Lavelle put out an article a couple months ago and made a tweet saying, oh, now the woke police is trying to complain about the use of aliens and extraterrestrials. And now they're asking me to say non-human intelligence. Uh, I'm sorry to hurt your, but facts don't care about your feelings or something like that. Um, and like, I, I, for someone who's not like, he has looked at this issue and that, but I don't, I, there's, there's a real fundamental reason why to use the dis distinct terminology of non-human intelligence, because the spectrum of origin, um, of the anomalous variety obviously is very expansive. We basically took, uh, I think, uh, there were two. There were two versions of this, and the name of the gentleman is escaping me right now. Um, I think it's maybe Rasmussen. He did an article in the debrief um, recently. He had his version, and then Carl Nell did his proposed UAP tax hypothesis taxonomy at the Seoul Conference. We took both of those and basically combined them into a unified system of identifying all of the – whether you're a Mick West and you think it's all misidentifications, if you're Stephen Greenstreet and you think it's psychosis – if you're, you know, an interdimensional person, if you're an extraterrestrial person, if you're a jinn, spiritual, all of those explanations, possible hypotheses are now organized into a system where each one has their own ID and a brief explanation. I think part of the reason for doing this is a lot of the conversation we see is it comes out as, oh, it's either black budget aircraft or aliens, right, it is sort of the, the two. And it's trying to help expand the conversation, understand that like even in the anomalous, it's not human bucket, it could be, are these higher dimensional beings having sort of a 3D representation of themselves in our space? Are they parallel to us in another dimensional space and they're able to transition in between? Are they simply off world? Are they purely a consciousness based thing that is able to have a physical manifestation, but is this sort of precognitive sentient phenomenon. I mean, and, and, and more specifically trying to correlate it to actual scientific concepts that exist that might be pushing the boundaries of where the science actually is defined now, but you can make 
logical steps from where we are now to that being the explanation. Again, that creates the ability for us to have more nuanced conversation when we talk about these things and also as on-ramps for new people looking into this issue to understand the breadth and scope of, of what might be possible. The idea here, one of the things we're going to start trying to do is as we see, you know, the conversations happen and Kingman, Arizona shows up, right? We're considering doing something where we take case files and then we associate the list of the proposed hypothesis that are most commonly associated with that case. So, you know, hoax is one of the examples and then it could also then, so what we can then start to do is say, oh, for each of these cases, Nimitz, go fast. Kingman, that we can sort of have those short list of here's the possible arenas of explanation. And then that can allow us to go back and look at the data and look and then try to really have the deeper conversation. So that's just like an, a, another kind of thing we've put out there just to, again, create these artifacts, these resources on devices that we use that are accessible on the devices we use every day um, and stylized in a way that consumers consume information. Um, and it's just pretty cool to think about because, you know, it expanded my, my kind of sort of world of thought um, around what is the possible solution set, which is there's 96 plus, I think, options. It's quite large. I think it's fantastic. I think that'd be really helpful. Definitely. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you about is you recently posted a photograph of yourself with uh, our friend Jeremy Corbella. I just wondered if you could kind of give us a bit of a backstory to that photograph. So... Um... Uh, so, so, um, Jeremy, I live in the same neighborhood that Jeremy grew up in, in California. So I literally live like a couple houses down from, you know, some of his family and stuff like that. So primarily, you know, as two people in this topic, um, who, you know, have domiciled near each other, it was necessary. Like it was just felt necessary for us to kind of connect and meet up, um, you know, I think Jeremy and I come at the game from different angles. We have our our, our lanes. Um, I know there's a lot of people that have a lot of opinions about Jeremy Corbell. Um, he he did approach me about a project. Um, it's not my project, so I really can't say much more than that. And again, I know I get it. I'm not trying to be that guy, guys. I know I get it, but I was asked the question. I'm responding with the information that I can give at this point in time. Anything that I'm in full control over, which is why I've really tried to maintain independence with the UAP caucus, I speak to at any time. So I'm, I'm able to be direct and et cetera. As I do any of these overlap or collaboration projects, I'm unfortunately limited by the original source in terms of what their perspective is on it. But it should be interesting. Um, I, I, I will, I'm not going to, it's not going to be earth shattering, but it'll be another, again, I'm not a bombshell guy. I am a incremental progress guy and it's not sexy. Um, and I know it's not really what people want. We want catastrophic disclosure. I totally get that. So the folks can push for that in there. Like we all have a job we can do, you know, I'll, I'll be the guy who cooks the vegetables, uh, and then people can go and chase the sugar. Um, so it'll be, it'll be interesting. I think it's just another node in the, in the spectrum of work that's going on. And, um, you know, I, I, I have no, I think, you know, I think, Jeremy has been nothing but just really welcoming for, for me. So I, I just I have to give him a lot of credit for that. Oh, that's wonderful. I, uh, I appreciate your answer and I fully understand and respect it as well. So thank you for that. Um, now, something else that you've been in, uh, involved with recently is the AIAA with the release of their website uh, and mandate and things like that. So again, for, for anybody watching who may have heard about the organization, but don't fully understand you know, what's happened recently and, and then what they're going to be doing. If you could just lay that out, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Yeah. So uh, for folks who don't know, the, the AIAA, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, is the largest aerospace trade organization in the world. I think they have 30, 40,000 members. Um, they're, they're leading technical expert in all things aerospace um, from, you know, different types of flight systems, propulsion methods, safety uh, protocols, management protocols, all that kind of stuff. So that organization has a subcommittee structure where there are different topics of interest that have a dedicated subcommittee where they bring in subject matter experts that can help to define the industry standards 
that then will get implemented by private aerospace companies, commercial or otherwise, and uh, airports, you know, space companies. So they're really thought leadership from a technical perspective that is utilized to help define the future of where the industry can go, how should we think about coordinating and handling a variety of different things. As a part of that, the uh, UAP, um, what is it, integration and, oh, integration and outreach committee, so the UAP IOC, uh, was started two years ago-ish now. Um, the co-chairs are Michael Lembeck and Ryan Graves. Michael Lembeck, huge, long history in NASA, Obviously, I'm sure the viewers know everything they need to know about Ryan Graves, the former Navy pilot who came forward. And I got connected with their director of operations, Ted Grace, last year. They were already in the process of updating the mandate and the kind of what they wanted the UAP subcommittee to do. And as a part of that, they wanted to have an ongoing, updatable web portal. If anyone saw the old website, it was, it was a landing page with some basic information, but there wasn't really much detail as to what was actually happening. Um, so that project was complete in October of last year. Um, and we had a really, the version that's released now is a much smaller version of what we originally built. Um, and um, originally we, when we built it out, um, you know, it, it, none of the, sub, the other subcommittees have a big web presence. This is their first subcommittee with a huge individual website. Uh, and that's important because the reason that it ended up having almost six months of review was I don't think they expected it to be as robust and as, as forward looking as it was. And then inevitably the management within the main AIAA infrastructure really had to sort of go in and say, okay, this is really great. Uh, we want this to get out there, um, but we also want to constrain the scope of what we are aiming to do um, and kind of let it evolve over time as we sort of put the pieces in place. So there's a, there's a long-term vision for the work that that subcommittee is going to do. The website launch was sort of two aspects, uh, releasing some early um, thought leadership content. The article that is really, really important is the detection, characterization, and evaluation paper that um, is really, really detailed about the systems and methodology by which you can start to think about how to go about detection. The thing people always say is we don't have enough data, right? Um, so I think there's some interesting information for people to glean there, but also, you know, read between the lines. You know, they're, they're not putting that out it, 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 anyway, so that paper is really important. The other thing that's interesting is the, the launch of the team. Uh, the team, I think, has maybe 16, 18 people or something. Um, there's some familiar faces on there. We see the likes of Orion Graves, uh, Aya Whitley, um, but there's also several new people um, that have had no previous public association with the topic uh, that are super high-level people with very distinguished you know, backgrounds. Um, and I, I've, I've, I got recently word yesterday, actually, that the amount of outreach that they've got, they've gotten an incredible amount of outreach from other technical subject matter experts that now want to get involved in some of the project and projects and programming they're doing. Again, think about this. We have several organizations, both within and without, inside and outside of the government that are now taking the UAP topic seriously, but there's nobody who like, in, within those organizations, nobody is prepared to actually, no one has the skill set and understanding for what to do about it, right? So the AIAA UAP is serving as sort of that external consultant that can provide that technical subject matter experts to the variety of these organizations that are now beginning to take this issue seriously. This is hugely important because then you're going to not have someone internally who just doesn't like the issue try to kind of derail it with their own personal vendetta you're going to have a true objective based organization who's just going to give them here's how you go and solve the problem so I, it's a really really it's like one of those things that again it's not like a sexy splash um because it's going to reveal everything all at once but as a signal of how far we've come since 2017 to have the largest 
aerospace trade organization on the planet dedicate a full-time effort uh, and a very uh, committed public position on the issue as the only subcommittee with that level of a public position is a meaningful thing. Um, and that will continue to evolve as, as that sort of plays out. I'm strictly on the product and development side. I'm not in the programming side of things. So that's outside of my purview. Um, but that's the kind of momentum that prevents this stuff from going back in the box, right? Because regardless of what the government does, they're going to be moving the issue forward despite that, right? So among all of the other people that are doing work. That's just one node in a very large process. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, breaking that down. I, I find it extremely encouraging. Uh, and like you said, you know, we, we can go now look at these other organizations outside of the government purview uh, who are just doing fantastic work. So thank you so much for that. Uh, and listen, Celeste, it's been a wonderful conversation. But before we go, please let us know of anything else that you are working on and things that, you know, you're doing later on in 2024 and possibly beyond. Yeah, no, absolutely. So again, you know, I think kind of, kind of coming back to what I said in the, in the middle of the call, really, you know, our focus, there are plenty of people doing great research. There are plenty of people doing great work with trying to get the whistleblowers out, trying to work to support the experiencer network and making sure that that's given the credibility it deserves as a part of this conversation. For us, we're trying to just do what work can be done to do that incremental progress. So a couple of things that are coming up. We are working to coordinate some call campaigns in order to support the likes of Representative Robert Garcia, uh, Glenn Grothman, and the UAP caucus around getting another public hearing in the House Oversight Committee. Now, there are two sort of avenues here. There's the House Oversight clearly has appetite to do it, but for uh, Comer, Speaker Johnson, uh, Representative Comer and Speaker Johnson are a little bit on the fence, but there's enough momentum with everybody else. There's probably going to be an entry point of what that content matter will be. There's sort of two avenues to public hearings, bringing whistleblowers or three, there's three angles, bringing firsthand whistleblowers, bringing gatekeepers, or the ancillary stuff like the aviation safety angle and the Langley blah, blah, blah. So it's unclear what the angle is going to be, but we're working on coordinating those call campaigns coming up in about maybe two to three weeks. Again, if we spend 25% of the effort and energy we spend analyzing everything that Jason Sands had to say, I'm not saying every, just 25% of that energy, the 30 minutes, the six hours, take 30 minutes of that, make a couple phone calls, that, that can have impact. So we're trying to re kind of set up that muscle memory for us. Um, so that's one. Two, um, I had an interesting conversation and I'm working with um, a small group that's within a large technology company. Um, they're an affinity group for UAP stuff. We're looking at doing an open data specification uh, for UAP data. So there's no standardization. You have Galileo Project doing their stuff. You have SCU doing their stuff. You have Seoul doing their stuff. You have UAPX doing their stuff. Um, but there's no, every kind of data uh, any industry that has large data sets has specifications that are standardized such that you can share data across organizations and be able to do better analysis, et cetera. This is another one of those things, like I was saying earlier, like what needs to be done in order to help move this forward? Standardizing uh, uh, data specifications for UAP data and then op open sourcing that. So we're starting to work on trying to s see if we can get the engagement of some of those entities that I just mentioned so that we can build out that open uh, that uh, UAP open data spec. Uh, what that, that would then enable is as more of these programs start going online, as Galileo Project starts releasing their data sets, we are already prepared with the standardization so that other experts can quickly grab that data, run it through their own analysis process, uh, and then we can start to take historical data sets and then reformat them with the new open data spec so now we can aggregate old historical data, standardize it, bring in new data, standardize it, and then have the massive then data set that you can start to implement AI pipelines to, et cetera. So before we can do AI, we need to have standard data uh, and more data. So that's, that's one of the interesting projects we're working on there. I'm really excited about that because again, that's on the discovery side, et cetera. And the last one is, is a little 
last one I can talk about right now is a little excess, less sexy. We're going to be putting out a white paper for the Safe Airspace for Americans bill. Again, anything that we can get that's passed that is related to this issue that will reduce stigma, help bring up more data and more reporting is a net positive and we should support, even if it's not the final answer. So again, this incremental vegetable work, um, we're, and we're working on getting that because we now have some great connections uh, within uh, Congress, we do think that we're going to get a lot of um, support with that white paper helping to define the, the issue and the importance of the bill uh, and then push for that as we get later into the year. So open data spec standard, uh, safe airspace for Americans white paper. Um, and then there'll be another one or two website projects you'll see me uh, involved with, with some other entities in the space doing exactly what we did with AIAA UAP and UAPC, which is elevating the, the user experience and the presentation of the data making it more accessible and have higher reach uh, for, I think, two other uh, aspects, one on the media side and one on the data and reporting side. So again, we're just focused on heads down and doing the work. We'll come up for air as there's new information that comes out. And I just, I want to say kudos to so many of the folks that are continuing, yourself included and everybody else that are continuing to keep the ball rolling. I think let's try to stay grounded, right? Um, everybody, as much as we can, let's just tr try to stay grounded. The sky is not falling and we haven't gotten to the end of the tunnel yet either. We're somewhere in the middle. I think we're making good progress. And I think, again, the momentum is still tr uh, sort of trending in the right direction. So we just have to keep doing what we're doing. Yeah, completely agree. And Lester, I really appreciate you and I appreciate the work that you're doing. And again, I just want to reiterate for everyone watching, the majority of what we have spoken about on this interview, if there will be a link to something where you can go and continue educating yourself and, and getting more context on uh, each individual part of this conversation. But once again, Lester, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Pleasure, Vinny. More soon. Thanks, my brother.